This week's podcast is brought to you by Onnit. Uh, their mission is to inspire peak performance through a combination of unique products and actionable information. They combine leading edge science, earth grown nutrients, and time tested strategies from top athletes and medical professionals. They are dedicated to providing customers with supplements, foods, fitness equipment aimed at helping people achieve a new level of well being called total human optimization. Basically, if I'm going to hawk something on my show, I'm going to make sure it's not crap. And on it has some really, really good stuff. The reason why I like it, I'm a scientist. It's what I do for my job. And all the stuff that they have on their site, um, first of all, it's organic, it's earth grown. It's, well, I mean, I guess there's no other place to grow it but earth, but it's, it's, it's good high quality supplements and they not only take the supplements and say hey we we put a bunch of stuff together take it and get stronger take it and get smarter or take it they actually do clinical studies with this stuff alpha brain is i don't know if you're familiar with this uh, savannah Steele was on uh, last week talking about nootropics or nootropics n o o t r o p i c s and the idea there is it's like a supplement for your brain alpha brain is clinically studied to help healthy individuals support memory focus and actually processing speed it is clinically demonstrated in a in two not just one two double blind and peer reviewed trials that it can help significantly improve multiple areas of cognition what makes it more unique unique is that the trials were conducted by the Boston Center for Memory and were successful on healthy subjects. I don't know what that means. I guess if you're not healthy, it might not help with you, but I guess they just weren't testing people with like Alzheimer's and stuff. Um, these studies suggested that alpha brain may improve your mental performance. Um, and if you, you know, don't take my word for it, go to um, waitwhatif.com slash on it and you can just go all, all over the site and, and, and check out the different things. www.waitwhatif.com forward slash on it. Listeners, if you want to try some of this stuff, you get a 10% discount because you listen to the Wait What If podcast. So. And then there's also a 30-day uh, money-back guarantee. What that means is if you order any of our entry size supplements. So there's, you know, 90 day supplies or whatever, big giant bottles of stuff, but um, there's entry size supplements. And if you don't like it, you can keep it, notify us, and we'll give you a full refund right there on the spot. No complicated intake forms, no return necessary. Um, the company basically trusts you. They know they have a good product and they know that once you start trying it, you're going to know that it's quality and it works well. Uh, and they're not really uh, afraid. Um, of too many people sending stuff back. Waitwhatif.com forward slash on it. 10% for Wait What If listeners. That's awesome. Check it out. Uh, We're also brought to you by Audible. Audible is a library of audio books. Um, Basically, you go to audibletrial.com forward slash WWI podcast and you can sign up for an account, which is free, and you get a free audiobook. I love audiobooks because I'm driving to work or I'm working out and I just don't have time to sit there and read a book from page to page. I haven't done that since grad school. I know, I'm lazy. What can I tell you? But when you have two kids and you're holding down a job and you're busy as shit and you really just want to get stuff done, but you also want to read and become a better person instead of just vegging out in front of the TV, Audible works for you because you just find one of those books that you've been waiting to to read and you just listen to it. Best thing is you work for, out for an hour. Uh, you just it, and let's say an average book is about fifteen hours long. There's you know two weeks of workout time there, uh, and you're you're not only getting yourself in better shape, but you're actually learning. You're actually making yourself better. So check it out. It's um, audibletrial.com forward slash wwi podcast. Get your free audio book. Uh, get your free account. You're listening to the Wait What If Podcast. We're about to blow stuff up. (laughs) Say we were to walk out in the middle of the woods and find a 50-year-old moonshine bottle. I think you could drink it. I think I would drink it. You know, his mom was probably really controlling, and he wet the bed as a kid. (laughs) 
Reminds me of a strip club, actually. Does it really? Yeah, yeah this is the champagne. Well, Hazel Jowell, make sure you put the money a little. I'm just going to eat this bacon and drink this whiskey. Be prepared to expand your mind and question your reality. As always, your host, Kevin Sullivan. Tonight we have a really cool episode, and I'm going to start it off by playing a uh, recording that got me basically into this interview that we're about to have. Um, it is a 47-year-old recording of a, a helicopter cockpit. It's a helicopter gunship, uh, and there's actually two of them. One of them is, is piloted by a guy with a call sign, uh, Waldo. The other one is um, piloted by a man with a call sign, Pigpen, who is the guy that we're about to call up and, and uh, have a conversation with. And then the third one, there's no, uh, you don't hear his call sign, but he's uh, another helicopter that's out there. They call him Slicks. You're going to hear this recording. Um, Got to kind of pay attention. It, it's, it's, they have, um, if you go on to, um, actually go to waitwhatif.com and I'll put a link on there and you can actually, you know, it's subtitled and you can see, you know, some pictures and stuff associated with it. And there's a little background info about, um, uh, you know, where they were and when this took place. Um, but listen to this. And afterwards, we are going to give Mark Garrison, uh, otherwise known as Pigpen, a call. And uh, we're going to talk about his book that he wrote for it. Uh, the book is called um, Guts and Gunships, What It Was Really Like to Fly Helicopters in Vietnam. Uh, and again, with that, if you want to check out that book, uh, you can go onto my website, uh, waitwhatif.com, and I'll put a link there uh, where you can pick it up. And you can also, hey, what a, what a coincidence. You can also pick this up on Audible. Uh, I think we talked about that uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, but you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash wait what or WWI podcast and open up an account and get a free audio book. And you can listen to this and say, hey, I remember when he talked about that during uh, the interview on the Wait What If podcast. So uh, listen, and I, uh, that's about it. And we'll meet you on the other side. Roger that, rolling in. I'm ready. Well, this is Pigpen. Yeah, you got 60, Go ahead, Pigpen. Yeah, I've seen all kinds of goddamn fire on the west side of y'all saying my minis are in off. Uh, we got red smoke on it. Where the hell are you at now? I'm right behind you. Roger that. Got the wall off and roll him. Punch off three or four rockets on the area. Roger that. Go ahead. So, Mike, I was browsing Reddit about 
gosh, I want to say it was about a month ago. And uh, it's it's usually what I do um, instead of working. And uh, I found... It's <laughs> a good hobby to have. That's right. And there was this, um, this video up there. It was like, uh, here's a cockpit... A uh, voice recording of when I almost got shot down in Vietnam. So I, I obviously clicked on it, uh, being an aviator and being a, a history buff. And uh, there was this really just a cool um, uh, audio recording of this helicopter pilot in Vietnam named Pigpen. So uh, I watched it and it was great. And I said, hey, do you know what? Uh, I'd like to contact this guy and see if maybe he'd be on the show. So I just uh, shot him an email and I said, hey, would you like to be on the show? And he said, sure. So so uh, we got him on tonight. We have uh, former uh, warrant officer too. What is that? A chief? Chief warrant officer too? I don't know how uh, you do that. In Vietnam, I was actually W one. Okay. After a year in in grade, he made CW two, unless you really stepped on it. So, Mr. Garrison wrote a book called Guns and Gunships, what it was really like to fly a combat helicopter in Vietnam, and. Um, yeah, I told you. One thing I like about this book, it's for someone like me who has a short tension span. Uh, it was like 80 chapters or something, right? And each one was only about a page or two long, and it told a little snippet of basically what it was like for him to go through. Uh, well, actually, first, how you found yourself in the military at an inopportune time. <laughs> Second, how you got into it. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, and then it goes through. I thought it was neat. You went through, you know, basically different things that happened to you while you were while you were overseas, which we're, we're going to get into tonight because I had some some questions about some of them. Sure, um, but um, yeah, it's a great book, and uh, I I highly encourage the the listeners to to if you're into helicopters and and you know modern history and stuff, check it out because it's it's good because it's it's a it's a good first person introduction into. Uh, helicopters and Vietnam and you know that that area that I just had not no knowledge about until I read it. So so when you like the forty years or whatever it was between you your experiences, did you did you live them every day or did you bury it and put it away and then have to revisit it to write this book? Uh, when I first came back, I had a recurring dream that wouldn't go away, and the only way that I could, frankly, the only way I could had any chance of it not occurring was to get snockered. <laughs> right. I mean, knee walking snockered. And what it was, was, and of course this almost happened to Nam two or three times. Um, I'd get my control shot out and I was spinning into the jungle. And right before I, um, uh, I woke up, bolted up in bed, diaphoretic as hell, tachycardic, respiration was probably 30. And it, it was, I was living it every night. Yeah. It wasn't a lucid dream. It, I, it, was, it was happening. It was real every night to me. And that happened for a long time. And then that kind of went away. But the reason I wrote it were basically threefold. One, the family wanted me to write my story down because I have lived a rather unusual life. And before, and so my story wouldn't die with me. And secondly, I wanted to try to get the Vietnam veteran and the Vietnam helicopter pilot the respect that he finally deserves. And I think it's done some of that from the, the from the uh, outpouring of comments and everything that I've got from people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. And uh, and also, I want to tell the story to as many people as I can. Like I said before, if it prevents just one more stupid tragedy like this then it will all be worth it and but i wrote it the the kicker the catalyst that made me write it was that the dreams went away but the the memories never would leave me alone entirely and i realized i had to cathartically puke it out on the paper and leave it and deal with it as an, an older adult 
because I did this when I was 21 years old. And that's asking a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you write it with a lot of life experience behind you, you're able to deal with it and then put some of it away, you know, or a lot of the way. And it has helped in that regard. That Those are the basic of the reasons I wrote it. That's why I started out with my first mission. And what a transition that was, which was brutal. From a college student fly school into that first mission that you read about. Sure. That was absolutely surreal to me. And it was just unbelievable. And then I thought... I had to go back and tell the people how in the hell I got in that situation and what fly school was all about. And that's why I tried to explain the controls and things like that. So people would have some clue as to what a helicopter was all about. There was this, I, I wrote a letter home one time and to my brothers. And uh, I said, if you see a helicopter flying over, don't believe it. It's a figment of your imagination because nobody actually fly one <laughs> and, you know and I also mentioned that the first time I tried to hover one they thought I was going AWOL I'm sure they did that's right I read that in the book yeah my god it was they're horrible at first they're, you know, overcorrect and I heard they were they say that there's only good helicopter pilots who are alive that's probably correct <laughs> there's no bad <laughs> helicopter pilots out there <laughs> <laughs> not, no, not any that are very old. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely coming from the Herc community. I was on a C one hundred and thirty, uh, which I mean has its own uh, quirks about it. But I hated going on helicopters. I would not. I'd rather go on a Herc or even a truck. <laughs> As an aviator on a long enough time timeline, you, you, you either find yourself uh, in a hairy situation or, or around some bent metal. Or you end up knowing someone that uh, has augured in. So it's it's one of those things where when I finally got out, uh, you know, I, I miss it. There's some things I miss, but for the most part, uh, you know, I told you I work as a PA now, and I don't have to worry about my yeah. desk bursting into flames or anything. So <laughs> it's much more relaxing now, and I enjoy that part. <laughs> well, I think PA would be a good job. I, like I told you my daughter was a certified nurse practitioner. That's right. That's right. Yeah. She works with PAs, and, and she works in my office, so I was a chiropractic physician. That happens a lot, people who, who go military, and I know you flew some medevac missions and stuff, and that's kind of what I did. I flew medevac missions, and yeah. and I kind of got that that need or that want to, to help people more and to try to, you know... Yeah, you really did. It, like, in the book, I made that clear that it, it wasn't very... Lo- the pilots and air crews were generally, I don't mean to sound arrogant about this. I don't mean that at all. But the, the pilots were generally a cut above, the, intelligence-wise, the general ground pounder troop. You know what I mean? But Because those guys got drafted, maybe didn't finish high school or anything else. And sure. I, I was in my third year of college when I went. So it it didn't take us long. Now, when we went over there, we were in a hell of a position. Uh, I was okay. born in forty seven, so I was twenty years old when I I got my draft notice. I was going to third year college, run out of money, and you had to report to the draft board immediately, or your it was a jailable offense if you didn't, and. Uh, I immediately went what's called 1A, and that meant you were on the top. Right, yeah. Of the, of the uh, list. So I, had, I either had that to do or run to Canada, and I sure as hell wasn't going to do that. Yeah. And um, Or I could do something that I thought might be worthwhile. So my brother was a pilot, and I decided to go to helicopter fly school. So I got the army to guarantee me that I took a first class flight physical and took the the flight aptitude test that you can only take one time and yeah they and we I signed up for that so as long as I met the requirements I could stay there. and that's the way I went in but I really didn't have a lot of choice yeah you know you you're going and 
And that's why it was so ridiculous for the country to blame us when we come back from the war. You know? Yeah, that, that whole, that, that was a mess. What, yeah. how, how do you find, um, and I guess one of the ways uh, I thought of this is, is because, you know, I got to know you through Reddit initially and then through your book. Um, how do you find that uh, the current generation, the kids that are around now, the millennials, I guess you call them, uh, like when you posted that that uh, video, do you find that, how are they receiving you and how are they treating you? Oh, absolutely. Fantastically <laughs> well. Uh, I mean, the, the comments are 99% uh, really, really well received. I mean, it's like, the, a typical comment is, how did they get their balls to the aircraft, you know? How they have a little blue balls and stuff like that. And we really respect your service. Thank oh you for your God. service and all that. Yeah. Is there a better feeling, and, and I have a personal answer for this one, but is there a better feeling in the world uh, than coming home? I mean, besides maybe marriage and kids, but for me, if my hierarchy would be marriage, kids, and coming home. Um, no, it was a fantastic feeling. I couldn't actually believe it because I couldn't believe that I'd actually lived through the tour. And one thing that dulled that was the spit in the face. Yeah, that, that's true, and I forgot about that. Yeah, their coming yeah. home was different than ours. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was. It, it got to where if you went in a bar in college to have a beer, I fought my way out of more than one. Yeah. Because these guys that decided you were the cause of all the problems and wars in the world and they threw four of them at yeah i don't know how through them, you know i don't know how you you couldn't uh turn around and and you know <laughs> reciprocate with your fist and then yeah. i would get if i got home and someone said something to me i would probably take it out on them no doubt well i wanted to but but i was in an office i was really surprised at first but then when you, it got to be later when you went in to have a beer or something, you figured out real quick. You guys have been in the military, you'll understand this. When, it, when people run around in groups of three or four, mm-hmm. they're, they're cowards. Yeah, That's why they're running around three or four. And so I found out the best way to get out of the situation was to act like you're walking away and what you're really doing is planting your right foot and coming back with the best right cross you had. <laughs> yeah. The biggest guy who was usually in the middle, and as soon as he went down, the rest of the guys scattered, and then he walked out. And that's basically the way it was because they never were alone, you know. Yeah. And uh, but I don't know why they blamed us in the first place. But then the the, the country in the eighties tried to make an apology, and it was just a, a day late and a dollar short. And if you notice now, everybody that puts on a uniform is a hero. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. the pendulum always swings. Even if these guys have got, are are going in to get out of going to prison, they're heroes. Yeah. Well. You know, that's it. Always swings too far one way or another. Well, yeah, I think it's uh, we we the country just feels so terrible about the way it treated your generation and your. Well, world. That's exactly you know, what it, it is. It's a knee jerk reaction, and I think it's almost absurd that uh, it's swung so far back the other direction. I think a good healthy in the middle is the best way to go. Oh, absolutely. I I always think it's it's fascinating. I mean, it was only, geez, man, it really wasn't that long ago. And to find the to find the entire sentiment of the country basically did a huge 180 turn. It really did. It did an about face. Mm-hmm. And uh, but back then, God, if they guys that did my job in Vietnam, if these guys are called heroes now or heroes, then we deserve a hundred congressional medals. Peace. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, God, it was just one day after another, I and mean, you never knew from one day to the next. It was interesting, I'll say that. Oh, you, had, you had enemies, um, <laughs> your your fellow American enemies, and then you also had the guys who were fighting in Vietnam were also enemies. Oh, it was horrible. And but but when going home was great to see the family and everything, and. And that was almost what was Nirvana compared to what the hell we'd been through. Because I flew like, I don't know, close to a thousand hours of combat. 
and uh, that was maybe it was several hundred missions and there were so many close calls it was just pathetic and uh, I, I remember when I got on the aircraft to fly home as soon as we cleared Vietnam airspace I told myself that I'd never bitch about anything again that it was all gravy from here on out now I haven't been able to do that <laughs> because I'm human yeah. but I've, tr- I've tried to and I realize how lucky I am and I lost 24 friends of mine over there there were pilots two dozen and it's still emotional for me to talk about you, some of them I saw burned to death and um, turned around one to, some of the stuff I didn't put in the book <laughs> Turned around one time, my crew, door gunner wasn't answering me, and I turned around and I saw why his head was gone. And uh, things like that just do not leave you guys. They just don't. No. And um, they just don't leave you. How many guys were responsible directly to you? So there was like maybe 16 pilots that, probably about 50 pilots in a company. Okay. Something. So, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is that oh, you had influence was, over. It, well, it wasn't set up that way. Okay. It was set up because most of the guys were saying there were, a, there was a commission officer that was in charge of each flight. And he was, his call sign always ended in six, like alligator six. Uh, I was a croc alligator for a while and flew slicks. Now, you had to get invited into the guns because they considered that to be an elite group. And, and a lot of guys didn't want anything to do with it because it was stressful to put high explosive warheads within feet of friendlies, if you know what I mean. Sure. But I got damn tired of going into these LZs that were. It looked like you could get maybe half a Huey on the low one. What they'd do is when you went in, they would, there might be a hundred, it might be a hundred foot tall, triple canopy jungle to hover right over it. And then you go straight down and you tell door gunner and your crew chief, who were both gunners on the aircraft, and the co pilot and the aircraft commander were all watching. And the guy flying it was on the left because his chin bubble was clear. So he could see down. And you'd start going down, and these guys back there might be saying, you've got a foot on the left. No, no, don't go any further, sir. And the guy on the right would say, no more room on the right. And it looked like the blades were going to hit the trees in the front. And you would establish a descent, and you were loaded. And so what that all translated into was – as you went down, the bad guys learned that you did not have the power to stop that descent and pull out of it. And if you tried to pull out, you'd run out the left pedal, you'd get your tail rolled under the trees or something, you'd tumble in and they'd barbecue you for lunch. It was just simple as that, if they were down there. But they'd wait until you were about halfway down in a good descent, and then they'd catch in a 10-2 or a 4-6 crossfire with about, who, kn- who knows how many AKs, and sometimes B-40 rockets and all kinds of crap. And you feel like there was a damn bullseye painted on the <laughs> bottom there. It actually, it actually felt like there was. And you were taking hits, and it makes kind of a slapping, ping sound. You, you know... Probably don't you, Kevin? What it sounds like? Well, that's that's the funny thing, and I was going to bring that up to you. There's there's a it, it's remarkable how you know your 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 helicopter is open, right? Your, your doors are open, your windows. So we actually it was a very silent way to watch a war because we would see things and you just see flashes and and muzzle oh flashes. And- I, suppose that, I suppose that would be true, but but it echoed through the whole aircraft mm-hmm. in a helicopter. Yeah. You didn't worry about the pings. What you worried about were the thuds. <laughs> yeah. You know, that something hit the, the tranny or the 
the bulkhead or the compressor stage of the engine, the thing going to compressor saw right there. But anyway, they'd wait till you got halfway down to where you were committed. And then they'd open up on you. And you had to just stay focused and keep looking down. And as soon as that happened, these got these LERP teams, their M16s were going like hell. Yeah, noisy. And the two M60 handheld M6, or the two tripod mounted M60s were going like hell. And hot brass often would fly down your neck. <laughs> and it was hotter than hell, red hot. But anyway, it's down your neck like this, and you're flying like this. God damn. <laughs> At first time it happened to me, I thought for sure I was shot. <laughs> and it burned the hell out of you, you know? And and then those guys would jump from 10, 15 feet. And if you think about that, they thought it was safer, and they were right. They thought it was safer to jump down in front of a bunch of guys with guns shooting at them. <laughs> That was to be on that helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gives you a perspective. <laughs> and that's what they did, though. But as soon as you got rid of the lerps, you got rid of enough weight to get the hell out of there. And but I didn't like that one bit. I don't. I, I would wager ten to one odds that you guys wouldn't like it either. Nope. One of my one of my biggest things is I, I always wished I had no way of shooting back, and I there were, part of me had a little bit of uh, uh, not animosity. I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but uh, the guys on the ground actually had guns, and I used to. I had a nine millimeter. I didn't even carry the damn thing. I just put it in my flight bag because what, what was I going to do with it? I, there was no reason to have a pistol. Uh, well, the only thing you could do was. I, carry, I I went into service with an M14. Are you, are you guys familiar with the 14? Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you hear that parrot? He's telling me, you guys, he's no chicken. <laughs> <Is he? laughs> he said, I'm no chicken. I'm no chicken. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you had to get an invitation into the gun for 10. They had to like you, and you had to be a decent pilot, they thought. So, and when there was a guy that left and went home, his name was Elmer Fudd. That was, <laughs> that was his nickname, and everybody got a nickname because of the way he looked or something. And yeah, it's, can, it's still that way. <laughs> kind of tell the way this guy looked. He looked like Elmer Fudd, but he was a fantastic gun pilot. But he went home, and there was an opening that came up. I tried to been there about three months, and then they had a vote and they voted me in if I wanted to go in and I just jumped at it, but it was learning to fly all over again. And, and this, far. this is to go from the alligators, which were the, the slicks. And then you're going to the, the Crocs, which were the gunships. Right. Yep. And they're two completely different jobs. They're the, the slick pilots are fantastic pilots too. I mean, they have to, you have to put it into really tight places and the gunships on the other hand, you didn't have the power and you re- they were very unforgiving. And, um, it was just a completely different kind of flying. Um, but at least you could shoot back. I mean, you know, you could shoot back and I, I liked that. Yeah, especially with the mini guns, right? I mean, you could put a lot of lead down range. Twenty four hundred rounds a minute apiece, and they were set by what the aircraft speed was. Like a jet would set at six thousand rounds a minute apiece, or a hundred rounds a second apiece. Right. And they'd shoot for like three second bursts, and then they'd shut off, or the barrels would actually melt down. Yeah, and, that's, that's no good. <laughs> yeah, that's generally not a good thing. No. And ours would shoot for three seconds too, but for six seconds for us would have been ridiculous because we're flying along at like 120 knots or something instead of 400 knots. And uh, so we would have been, that would have been an incredible super saturation and a waste of ammo in a helicopter. Because yeah, okay. well, we had them set up. You could put a bullet in every square foot of the of ground if you knew what you were doing. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're going slower, so you don't need as much because you're not, you're not zipping across the ground. So waste. And at night, when you fired them, 
every fifth round was a tra or phosphorus tracer. And it actually looked like at night like you could get out of the aircraft and just walk down the the tracers. Oh sure, yeah. I've seen and there this. were four rounds between every one that you could see. And which is you know, the one the Vulcans and the the jet minis, I mean, they had ridiculous rates of fire. Yeah. But, they're awesome, awesome weapons. No question about that. Mike, have you ever seen the um what is it they have at the bases now? I saw one before I left. It was like an R two D two looking robot that had a mini gun on the top. And Wizards? If, what was it called? Uh a wizard? I don't know if a if a round uh, was coming in. So what these things would do, it was they had automated, a, it was yeah. calculated where it was coming from and was shoot it out of the sky before it landed in the base. Yeah, so if it picked yeah. up a, a round coming in, a a mortar or a rocket it would, you, you had a couple radars that would come up with an algorithm, and then this R2-D2 looking thing out of nowhere would just and just put all sorts of lead towards it to blow it up before it hit the, the base. And same thing, it looked like yeah. uh, uh, just a, like a laser beam. There was just insane. Was it green or yeah. red? I don't remember. I don't know, I don't know either. But it well, it depends. <laughs> Even the tractors? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't know this for certain, but I know what you're talking about, and it's it's new, it's fairly new. It's old technology with a new application. Yeah, the Navy uses them for their ships too. That's where I think they came from. Yeah, yeah. In any way, but anybody that's been in combat, like in Vietnam, will tell you that tracers coming at you look green, and the the tracers you're putting back at them are red as hell. Okay. And the only way that I can describe that would be the Doppler effect. I mean, like the the universes, for instance, or, or the galaxies are are expanding all the time, so they have a red shift to them. I I got a question. I just kind of want to go back to what we talked about before, and I'm and I'm asking more in the context of the Vietnam, where a lot of guys were drafted and they didn't want to be there, and there was a country that didn't really respect anybody. In, in our war, and I, I spent a year in Iraq, and I had another year in Afghanistan. So you know, and then being a platoon commander and a company commander, I think it, for me it, it wasn't that difficult. Well, I, I think it's always difficult to inspire and lead, but I have a feeling that for you guys it was much more of a challenge to really inspire the guys to go above and beyond and and to, to push the extra mile and, and to make things happen. So I'm just kind of curious your experiences in that and then how did you guys go about, you know, making making it happen, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. We were kind of – our situation was rather ancillary to that that you described. There was a tremendous camaraderie between the pilots because – we all depended on each other, and we knew it. And it, it was just a natural occurrence for everybody to work together, or everybody died together. It was that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we weren't responsible for directly for the what we call the grunts, or the. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I've got the greatest respect for those guys. I mean, they had. We still call uh, them grunts. <laughs> They're still, yeah. They love it. They love being called grunts. Well, at least in the Marines, yeah. they do. Yeah, they had horrible conditions. and But we weren't re responsible for their, uh, you know, keeping them up to snuff, except for the fact that they loved us and hated us both. They had a love-hate relationship. They hate, they loved us when we come and got them, and they hated us when we took them out. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> you know, but they loved to see, all of them will tell you they loved, they still loved to hear the wop, 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 and you know, the rotor blade. And uh, so we had a great relationship with the, uh, the guys on the ground because we were we were their saviors, you know. Sure, we were supposed, yeah. We were supposed to be, and then a gunship. The, the incredible pressure on you was the fact that, I mean, many times the North Vietnamese would be. These are North Vietnamese regulars. The Viet Cong had been pretty well wiped out in the Tet in 1968. They were still around, but. North Vietnamese regulars were really 
well-trained and disciplined troops. You know, they were sometimes 30, 20 or 30 feet away from who you were trying to save in a gunship. And they would be running through the... Did you... Did you uh, Mike, did you have Prick 25s or did you guys have Prick 25 radios or were they gone? Uh, we had, I think, Prick, I, th- I remember Prick 19s. Yeah. <laughs> That's we, the number I remember. Yeah, we had those in our uh, survival vest, Prick 19s, I believe. They're the ones where you could, well, the survival ones are probably different than the, the Prick 25s, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were on the back. These guys would be running, and I'm going to recount a few of the issues in the book. About they'd be running through the jungle and whispering and going, well, yeah, well, they were, can you, uh, can anybody help us? Can give us pop smoke. Can't, can't, they'll give it a position why we can't. They're right on us. They're right on us. While they were, and you could hear the branches hitting them in the face and they were terrified. But we couldn't do anything if they didn't mark them. Their position was smoke, or we might kill them. Sure, yeah. 30 feet is not far away. No, and you really had to be accurate. And we were the last guys that really, you see, we were the ones that had to develop all of the helicopter war strategy because it was the first time it had ever been done. Yeah, that was something I was I wanted to bring up with you. You were going into combat with new technology. I mean, they had used it, but not, not in the way that you guys were flying with it. No, no. I mean, every day was a learning experience. And usually it was a racetrack pattern you developed where one guy was breaking. That's your most vulnerable. Sure, yeah, your belly's up. He's laying minigun and rockets underneath. And then he comes around and he covers your break in a racetrack. And you try to find a way to, a place to break long, short, right, left, whatever, where you're not receiving fire. Sometimes you couldn't do that. Yeah. You never, you learn never to overfly the enemy unless you absolutely had to. Mm-hmm. And because that was, that was just asking for it. Yeah, those tactics. And, and we brought that up a lot when I would be in my tactics classes that, um, yeah. you know, the, the, tax, the tactics were written by, by the guys in Vietnam. So we. Yeah, we were the ones that developed it. And it was a trial on our basis. It really was. You didn't know what was going to work when it wasn't. Uh, so you just had to go out and just try it. Um, there's this weird dichotomy about war or being in a combat zone or something like that. It's it, it, without using a, a cheesy cliche, but it, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. There were times where it was just awful. You didn't want to be there. There were times where you were just bored off your ass. But then there were those times where you're playing poker or where the entire crew is working. Just, you know, when you're just on it, where, where everybody is just on their A game and you're getting the job done. And you're everybody's just, in, we call everybody's in the zone. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. And you look back on that and you say, like, when I look back on Iraq, I, you wouldn't get me there. I, I'll never go back to Iraq. But uh, I still, there's, there's this part of me, and I almost kind of feel guilty about it. There's a part of me that enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, being there as much as when I was there, I wanted to come home, but. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, that the human being has a great capacity for adaptation. And that's what you were showing is your ability to adapt mm-hmm. and, and actually make a good situation out of a bad one. You know, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We, I, I developed bonds with these pilots. Uh, and since I've read the book, I've heard from all kinds of guys that I haven't heard from in I don't know how long. And uh, it was just, the bonds are just lifelong. Yeah. And th- very, very strong. I think, and it's an important thing too, uh, one of the things I noticed, because when I got out of the military, I, I went to grad school. Uh, and I'm just curious about about this question. How do you find it is working with with civilians, people who have never served in the military. Did you find that a little difficult? And uh, you, like when I would go to grad school, I had, a, I had a task to do. I had the discipline to get it done. And then if I didn't do it right, I didn't quibble. I just, I just learned from my mistake and moved on. A lot of these kids who are in their 20s and very, very small percentage of, of my generation actually served. It's only like a half a percent. Yeah. These, these guys would just quibble. 
I'll answer that by finishing your sentence for you. Okay. <laughs> I found them naive. Uh, didn't understand the world. Didn't understand what real violence really was. Didn't understand that it took hard work to get something done that was worthwhile. Sure. That's what I found. Sure. Uh, which I think is, is also important. And, and I don't want to be the one to break this to you, but uh, Vietnam has become uh, the grandfather's war. When I grew up, it was our father's war. And now you got a, a gu- bunch of kids who are coming of age who this is their grandfather's war. And they're losing touch of that for two reasons. Yeah. One, yeah. I mean, you guys are in your late 60s, 70s, and in 20 years, yeah. you know, 80s and 90s, um, we're going to start losing that connection with folks from Vietnam. The second thing about that is we're in an era of revisionist history uh, where, you know, and, and you know what, what, I mean, I don't have to go into detail about that, but it's important for you to tell your story and for you to get your story out there, and it's important for them to read about it. Well, yeah, that's why I was so... Uh, so uh, eager to do this interview with you guys because uh, I want to get this story to as many people as I can get it to because I really think it's important if it if it will prevent one more ill-advised war or skirmish if it would prevent one more death or even one more injury then it's all worth it to me you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So you, because I saw so much violence and God Almighty, it was just horrific. And then when you come back and see that it was all really for naught because of a bunch of goddamn politicians. That's right. And and they they sure as hell weren't out there. If if I could have got them out. If, Got them in one gunship mission, and they had to do that every day. There wouldn't have been any war, guys. Don't don't you think um, Iraq was is kind of like that? Politician Iraq. politician led. Iraq is a stupid. I I don't. I have a tendency just to say what I feel and not bullshit. You guys might not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you what I feel. <laughs> uh, I think Iraq was the stupidest son of a bitch that we ever could have done. I mean, it's, it was like Iraq didn't knock down the world trade centers. It would have been like, El, it would have been like FDR uh, attacking Argentina after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. Do you think it's any coincidence that the guys who were in charge of all that, uh, some were military. I think Rummy was, uh, Rumsfeld was military and, and Bush was military, but none of them served combat. Uh, that's not no. a coincidence. Bush, I don't know. He thought God told him to run for president. And they might, <laughs> but tells me that. What we call that in chiropractic school when we took introductory psychiatry. Anybody that thought well, you can tell me he's a PA. What we learn, we learn that anybody that thought they'd talk to God was was called a schizophrenic. <laughs> that's, that's right. I don't like my my commander uh, who has their finger on the button to hear voices. I just it doesn't yeah. make me sit right. It's not a comfortable feeling, and he actually told people that. Um, but yeah, you say for, something. Yeah. yeah, not to get on that track, but you were saying. Um, the, the Vietnam being, you know, uh, a war fought out of politics. Don't you think that that the military is the is the strong arm of the political will? I mean, I think all, aren't all wars fought for some political reason? Uh, yes, I think of course they are because, in a, especially in a democracy like ours, it's it, that's why it has civilian leaders that and the commander in chief who's civilian and, and the legislature and all that who order that declare war and the military does what they're told to do. But that's so there's what, always some, I guess there's always some, I mean, there's always, there's always a political reason or political will behind it. We don't. Uh, yeah. Even but World I, War II was, it was politics. Well, I think I World War II was probably necessary though. Yeah. That one. I Yeah. You're probably, you're right on that one. That was yeah, World War One was, was, was pretty yeah. ass. That was awful. That yeah, was, that was you, some goddamn arch 
Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Yeah, that was pretty yeah. silly, but it was pol- yeah, it was all the got the shots. I, everybody killed millions of people over. Can't believe it. Human beings. Sometimes I think war is a is a depopulating evolutionary advice. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really halfway serious. Consider the idea. They did experiment experiments with rats. Okay. And Kevin, I think being in medicine, you'd be quite interested in this. And, and so would you though, Mike, mm-hmm. I read, this was an index peer reviewed study. It, Meaning, of course, that it is repeatable and they come up with the same results. And they put a bunch of rats in this area and they they let them uh, conger, uh, breed and get crowded and run short of food. And so they all broke up in little factions and they bore, they rats are really pretty intelligent. And they broke up into factions and they formed gangs and the gangs would kill one another and stake out their territory. No shit. <laughs> God, that's well, here, here's, here's, here's the kicker. So then they started taking some more variables out of it. They did the same experiment, except they gave them all the food and water they wanted to drink. And they, but they let it get filthy and they still broke up into gangs and stuff. And then the, the, the last thing they did was they kept it clean as hell. They gave them everything they wanted to eat, everything they wanted to drink. And they still killed one another in gangs. So the conclusion was it was the crowd that did it. Wow. So that's why I said what I just said. I wonder, you know, you notice every people fight wars over the craziest damn reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And some, and, and there's more wars statistically in crowded areas. It just happens. So, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do about it. But <laughs> 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 we'll get together on a paper and get a PhD. I hope, I hope we get it right. Because um, <laughs> now, now I have a, a toddler son and, you know, I never really thought about it as a father now that, Uh, I mean, I've been to uh, a combat zone. My father was in the Navy. My grandfather was in World War II. Uh, My great-grandfather. I mean, I have relatives all the way back to the Civil War all had to go and fight. And we just haven't figured it out. And I I don't want my son, you know, to have to to figure this out, too. I mean, to to have to go and fight somewhere. And and what's the common denominator? You don't have the word senator or representative in front of my name. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, the song from uh, Credence comes to mind. Yeah, for, Senator's son, for, or Fortunate Son. Fortunate Ones, or Fortunate Son. I'm no fortunate one. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the Fogarty nailed that. Sure. Because no, there wasn't any Senator's Sons over there or whatever. George Bush didn't go either. Nope. George Bush intentional national, national guard wasn't he national yeah. guard. texas national, texas texas yeah, what, guard. Yeah, what wasn't even real was it well you guys are a lot younger than i am you gotta understand one thing back in those days the national guard was the way out of active military duty now it's a way in oh sure it is yeah but, but back then if you wanted that there were lines and lines of people that were hankering to get in the National Guard because they knew they'd never see Vietnam if they did. Yeah. And, uh, but now, of course, that's different because of the volunteer army, but then it was a draft army. Here's, here's a, a side question, just curious. When was the first time you heard of the country Vietnam, if you can remember? It was in the early 1960s. And the reason I remember it was because of good-looking women. And I was in a uh, blossoming young male. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, because they had a picture of the most beautiful women in the world or something in Life magazine and it had the, the girls of Vietnam. And, and they really were pretty. And then, but I didn't know anything more about it than that. And it's funny how you bring up good looking Vietnamese women because I, I believe I read a story about you getting a, a massage and falling asleep <laughs> and having nothing but your. That was a story that was also very true. Right. As a matter of fact, 
there was a lot truer than the truth that I put down. <laughs> I wondered about that. I wondered about that, but I, you know, you got to. <laughs> no, I mean, man, that was a close call. That really was a close Sure, call. that sounded I, awful. I was, I was in a damn alley, and I can still, I can still feel the wetness on my face. Uh, I broke my damn toe on a well. <laughs> and had my boots on, and I couldn't make it. Couldn't make it. I had my forty-five pulled. I had three or four clips. Can you uh, can you recap that story for the listeners? Kind of let them let them know what, exactly what happened and how you got there. Sure, I can. Okay. Uh, I got to the Crocs, and these two guys came in. Like I said in the book, they'll remain nameless, and they still will. You said rest. Jake and Snake, I believe, in the book. <laughs> I, I said I'll call them Jake and Snake for the for just for the ease of it. But anyway. Uh, they said, I said, what are you guys doing here anyway? And they, they got to roll me out of bed. I mean, grab me and roll me out of bed. And said uh, that you haven't been initiated properly into the Crocs yet. So you're coming with us. Your mission has been scrubbed. So they got me, they commandeered the Jeep and they roared into town. I thought sure I was going to die on the way in there. I was hanging on for a dear life in the back and he was hitting every pothole in the road and I thought I was going to bounce out of the damn thing. But then we went to a tailor shop downtown Got us. they got picked up suits. Boy, you can get a really nice suit Hong Kong tailor for like a hundred bucks or three piece. It was worsted wool. It was really nice suit. I still got the one I bought. I can't wear it. Um, maybe uh, I get half of me in it. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, it's still after all these years, it's still in great shape. But anyway, uh, then they took us down to the. It was called the Mama Sons or some damn thing like that. You know, the whorehouse. I knew where they were taking me, and uh, then we got in there, and they these guys left with girls, and I said I'd have a few beers first. And they came back after they did their little thing and said, are you still sitting here? And uh, they asked this girl to come over that had approached me before. And I said, come back in a few beers. And said, take uh, Pig Ben back here and show him a good time. So by then I was ready to go. And then she asked if I wanted a massage. And I said, sure. You know, and that's all I needed for sleep. And I went to sleep, and I woke up at 5 o'clock right at curfew, and I went out, and there was nothing but civilians out there, and all the soldiers were back on base, and I thought, oh, hell, I'm screwed now. And uh, so I knew I had to hide somewhere that night, because the, the North Vietnamese sympathizers were all over the cities. And if they knew you were down there, they'd cut your throat in a heartbeat. And I looked all over for this girl, and so I couldn't find her, and I went out to the alley and thought, well, that's where I'm going to have to stay. There was an alley that run behind all the businesses that uh, was – there were their wells there so often where their water supplies were and things like that. And uh, I was back there, and all of a sudden this girl showed up, and I asked her, took the chance that she was friendly to – even at night to American soldiers. So, and she was, and she asked me what I was doing there and said that I, she heard I was there. And she took me to her apartment and put me up there. And uh, the one very little, she'd left and went somewhere. And all of a sudden she came back in and she was talking real excitedly and said, you got to hide. You got to get out of here. <laughs> these, these men are coming. They're going to kill you. And all I had was this 45, and uh, my boots were by the door. They always take their shoes off at the door. And uh, so I ran out in the alley, and I thought, oh, hell, I left my boots there. That's a nice calling card. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I ran behind a, a, a well, and I saw them through the window. And they were waving their arms. These guys were. They had weapons. They were waving their arms. And she's yelling at the girl, and she was kind of yelling back. So I went down another well, uh, a few feet down the alley, and then they came out. And I had it cocked and chambered and ready to 
I thought Cheryl was a goner. And, uh, but anyway, she was, she was, uh, a true South Vietnamese girl that wanted uh, democracy and not communism. And she did not not like the North Vietnamese. And and didn't you say you were worried uh, that if they did get you, what type of letter your mom would have got? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I said uh, that uh, I could just see the headlines at home, the war on Officer Garrison uh, Gunned down, I guess, gunned down by sharpshooting whores <laughs> in a brothel, uh, drunk and disorderly. <laughs> My mother would be so proud of me. <laughs> I but think, anyway, oh no, they sorry. came out in the alley. They came out in the alley and waving around out there. I thought, sure, they were going to find me and then we're going to have to have to shoot it out. And um, but anyway, they. They left back in, and then they left, and I stayed all night there. And then, then when the the I couldn't wait for the rooster to crow, I tell you. And I got I caught a military truck when the the curfew was off, and the morning post opened up again, and just rolled back in like nothing had happened. <laughs> no, nobody uh, noticed you were uh, gone in the on base. No, well, yeah, they did. It's like the, guy, the guys there, Jake and Snake, will call you. They looked all over for me and looked, and you know, they couldn't find me. And she had me back in some kind of a, it was like a maze back there. So I don't blame them. And they had to get back. And I was drunk and, and massaged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was screwed, blued, and tattooed. <laughs> Is anyone. <laughs> Is, uh, is there any uh, any dumber thing to do than to take young eighteen to twenty five year old men, give them give them machines of destruction, uh, and put them in a foreign country where well, there's <laughs> liquor whores and <laughs> yeah, you make a valid, a very salient point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and that's that's why. That's why, you know, they have middle-aged men commanding teenagers. <laughs> if teenagers were in charge, they'd really have things fixed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Testosterone abounds, you know. That's right. I remember reading in your book, um, you were exposed to Agent Orange um, pretty extensively on multiple occasions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, but Agent Orange is the worst thing that's happened to me. We we had to. There there's a uh, an aircraft. They covered. They carried Agent Orange in one twenty three providers. Kevin, are you familiar with that aircraft? I I believe so. Uh, it was a uh, tail dragger. Uh, uh, well, I don't remember whether it was a cell dragger or not. I didn't pay that much attention to it. It was when it was on the ground. I usually picked them up on the road in the airborne. Okay. Oh, um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking the C forty seven. That's what. That's what. Oh, I'm you're thinking about. of the DC three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the provider was a nose gear, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there were C one twenty three providers. Matter of fact, there's one in the United States Air Force Museum, and its name is Patches. And his claim to fame is that it took it's, it took more than six hundred hits in Vietnam. Wow! And, and I described a lot of those missions, and when we had to go out in gunships and and escort those guys, and we, you'd be back behind them in like a seven or five o'clock position, higher and back. And they'd, they'd always receive fire, always. Those guys on the ground did not like that crap dumped on them. I don't blame them. And so they'd say, receiving fire, receiving fire, 9 o'clock, 200 meters. And what you had to do, and, and it seems like always they just dumped the load of Agent Orange. It was just a big cloud. But what you had to do is see, you'd look down and see the muzzle flash. So you had to fly right toward it. And doing that, you flew through the cloud. And you mentioned a while ago, Kevin, about how you couldn't hear rounds, but we could because all of our doors were open. Mm -hmm. Well, all that shit flew in through the doors, and our flight suits were wet with it. 
And that happened to me a hundred times if it happened once. Hmm. And I was diabetic uh, before I left Vietnam. I weighed 165 pounds. I bench pressed 250. I had abs. And the, the guy that diagnosed it at Beach Army Hospital, his name is Major Marvin Brooks, sent me to the lab three times. And uh, he, he said, I don't know. They're making a mistake. You, you can't have diabetes. And finally, he had to admit that I did have it. He said, I've never seen it before in my medical career. But they didn't know what Dave George was doing back then. No, no. And uh, so I've dealt with that for 40 some years and I'm running into problems now with. Do you, and, do you have any uh, children? Yeah, and two of them I wonder about whether some problems they have. Well, well you know, they've put spina bifida as a official side effect, mm-hmm. first generation. Well, my oldest son has a spina bifida occulta. He has low back problems now through an injury that really shouldn't have hurt him. That's disabled him for six years. What's What's amazing about that is that these are injuries from a war for, with people that were never even alive during it, not even uh, considered. Yeah. And you think yeah, too in Vietnam. Crazy. In Vietnam, they're 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 having the same issue. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know, when I researched the book, do you know why they put dioxin, that terrible poison, in in Agent Orange? Agent Orange is basically just uh, a glorified roundup. But do you know why they put dioxin in it? No idea. I always thought it was a killed plant. I mean, what the hell? It's obvious, right? But it wasn't. It was an adhesive agent. It it made it stick to the plant where rain would even wash it off. Well, see, that happened to us, too. Because a lot of times when you were flying these uh, missions to protect these birds, these providers, you you were remaining overnight. You were RONing, and you couldn't change clothes, let alone shower, for a couple of days. So, and, that, and hell, all of us are diabetic, uh, Kevin. I, the, the guys were out in the field. Really? It, well, it's because, it's because Agent Orange is what did it. It's what, that's what the VA tells me. In uh, 07, they gave me another lethal, fatal diagnosis. They said I had myelodysplasia. And they took three bone marrow, as, aspiration bone marrow uh, biopsies and three board certified Hematologist, oncologist agreed. So they said I had 18 months, and I didn't say anything to the family because I maybe I was denying it, but I didn't want to worry them. I went back two years later because I was still alive. (laughs) (laughs) And they they gave me another uh, aspiration bone marrow biopsy and said I had six months. Then I told the family I was supposed to be dead in 09. And um, oh, wow. I did. Yeah, this this is. And anyway, I and I've been anemic ever since I came back from Vietnam. For and they say that's all Agent Orange too. This is wicked shit. This dioxin is, and it's long term. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I started doing some things that I thought might stimulate the marrow because another. Name for monosplasia is pre leukemia or bone marrow failure. But I didn't have many blast cells, if any, so it gave me a little bit of hope. And uh, so I took, I laid out in the sun until I got black, Kevin, trying to stimulate <laughs> <laughs> the marrow. And I took vitamin uh, cholecalciferol, you know, D3 and all kinds of shit. Just anything I could think of to try to affect the outcome. And I made an appointment at Mayo Clinic. And I went down there, and whether I did it or whatever happened, or it was a spontaneous remission or whatever, uh, they, they run me through every test in the book. And when I, got to, I read the report, got to page seven, I said, this patient has a normal marrow. Gosh, and I went down there and said, thinking that I was a dead man, 
and I came back with the damn iron pill. So that's what you call dodging the bullets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Looking back on it, um, if you were given the opportunity to not have been to, to Vietnam, let's say you could go back in time and change it, would you do that, or, or is, is it part of you now, or is it something that... Uh, that's really a difficult question. I, I, I think my initial... I don't think I would change it for one reason. Uh, because I learned so much about what's important in life and what isn't mm -hmm. that I would not have learned otherwise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Guts and gunships, the true story of... What, what it was really like to fly combat helicopters in Vietnam. That's right. And it's linked to... I have a link on it on my website, uh, waitwhatif.com. I put it up on um, uh, my Twitter and my Facebook. Because uh, I've been really pushing this this uh, this interview. I've, I, I've been doing a lot to make sure that people know that this one's going to be out there. I appreciate that. Uh, it's become our grandfather's war now. And it's, it's you know... Yeah. Yeah, it has. And, you know, the story needs to be told by more. People ought to write their stories down because, damn it, they'll be buried with them if they don't. And I appreciate you guys getting hold of me and allowing me to do this. No, this is this is fantastic. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. You know, you told some personal stories, and and it was fantastic. Well, you guys have been great, and I like your sense of humor. <laughs> uh, no, the, the email uh, string we had going. We ought to publish that. That was hysterical. <laughs> I was I was half convinced you were going to do this interview in a loincloth. <laughs> <laughs> what i damn near did i damn near put that parrot on my shoulder and put an eye patch on <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't know how, how far your sense of humor went <laughs> that been great. yeah that would have been really good I All right, oh trust me you, but, you, <laughs> but you lied to me kevin yeah you said you guys were two bearded goons, and I only saw one. <laughs> yeah. In, in between, in between me emailing you, I had uh, what I like to call a class one A failure of my um, my beard, and I kept I kept trying to fix it, and I'd shave it lower and lower, and then I was like, out of hell with it, and I just took it off. So it's it's on its way back, but exactly what I do. My wife tells me when I grow beard, she can tell me it's hard because it starts getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> it's a little bitty pencil mustache. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> can, can I ask you real quick, since we're, sure. since we're completely off track right now, or off topic, and we're wrapping it up. Um, yeah, do, you, okay. do, you, do you drink? Do you drink? What's your drink of choice, if, if I could ask? If you, or if you don't. Uh, you know, I, I used to flat slugger down. And I, but uh, I don't drink much anymore, but you guys said uh, that you had a few on the podcast, so I've joined you here with this white here. I thought, I thought maybe you did, and I was curious what it was that you were drinking. <laughs> this, this bourbon. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bourbon guy myself. They really flatten your wallet out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was never into it, and then Mike moved in next door to me, and uh, I went over there, and one of the first things he showed me is like, hey, look at my my whiskey collection, and <laughs> it's it's it would put most people to shame, so I slowly got into it. <laughs> a distillery out of West Virginia. I don't know if you've heard of Smooth Ambler. They have a whiskey called Old no, Scout. Uh, no. What about you, Kevin? I, I have a very... Um, sensitive and refined palate <laughs> have you ever heard of uh have you ever heard of old crow yeah, <laughs> there you go eight dollars a bottle <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the problem is the problem is with my drinking which I, I try to curtail every now and then is i have two alarm clocks um one is a two-year-old toddler girl and the other one's a three-year-old toddler boy and um, I'll tell you what, 6 a.m. is very, very early after you've put away uh, some whiskey. So, <laughs> Look, I will tell you, I've raised four children, and uh, my God. Now, there's, I'd rather go back and get off here and do that again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's nice meeting, nice meeting you, Marine. Hey, you I, too. I, I, flew, I, I flew for you guys over there sometimes. 
Oh yeah, how was that? That, that had to have been a little well, bit different. I mean, they got they got into trouble on the ground. Always. <laughs> well, listen, guys, it's been great. Yeah, man, a lot of it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll talk again. Yeah, if I can do anything for either one of you, just let me know. Thanks. All right, I appreciate that. Okay. All right, take care, Mark. Okay, take care, guys. Like us on Facebook.com slash WWI Podcast and at WWI Podcast on Twitter. Drop us a line at Wait's What If Podcast at Yahoo.com. Listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Internet Radio. your listening experience. Now go forth and expand your reality.